We now have, uh, we're going to have uh, an extraordinary panel uh, just to make some comments and offer some observations uh, about the film. And I'm waiting for the appearance of the uh, extraordinary filmmaker, uh, Crystal Emery. Am I, is, is, am I, am I bringing uh, the love for or am I bringing up Crystal? So uh, I um, I got to know Crystal Emery by by phone. Um, she stalked me uh, cross country about this work she was doing around diversity and um, explained to me quickly that. Uh, she was a, a quadriplegic and she was going to make this film. To which I said, okay. Um, and so, if there is anything that is as inspiring as what you just witnessed, in terms of the passion, the creativity, the courage, the strength of these women of color in this profession, it is at least matched, and if not embodied, in this person, Crystal Emery, who was the writer, producer, director, fundraiser, <laughs> just drove 3,000 miles from Connecticut, four days to be here tonight.
talk about the celebrity status of who they are. I met Danny Glover in the 80s when he was in a play called Master Harold and a Boy. Lord Richards was my mentor. I am the last director personally trained by him. And at that time, Master Harold was a hard play, looking at the realities of apartheid in South Africa. And Mr. Glover was a very kind man. Years later, Bill Duke, who also was trained by Lloyd Richards, would give me my first job on a feature film. And who was one of the stars of that feature film? Danny Glover. <laughs> And Danny had had knee surgery. So he had a little tiny incision while my knee surgery took up from my thigh to my ankle. And, um, but, so it is an honor of an energy vibration to be here in California endowment and the work that they are committed to around health equity. <coughs> to be here with Bill Duke and Danny Glover. Like, wow, I could go home and be like, hey, I just got the spiritual Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank each of you for coming. I always say this, that ordinary people, and I do consider myself an ordinary person, but we can do extraordinary things. And what do you do with the gifts that you've been given? You know, each of us can be part of that change. And so if you were inspired by the film, don't just go home and say, hey, it was a great film. Go home and do something about it. Um, you can do something by supporting our project. But you also should do something with your neighbor, with your family, with your friends. Because honestly, it is really about a love vibration. It is about that positive energy. And so with that, I am going to introduce my mentor, uh, Bill. He fusses at me all the time. <laughs> Crystal, you know, you're really creative, but you don't listen. <laughs> and then he gives me a list of extraordinary tasks. And I go, OK, Bill. If I get two of them done, it's a miracle. But I'm going to introduce you to Bill Duke, who is our moderator this evening. I thank all of you for coming, and I'm so pleased.
you're after to see me now. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is an important evening, it's an important topic with a great human being who put this together. And so, without further ado, we want to introduce our panel. Um, first of all, Dr. Claudia Thomas. As I stated in my comments earlier, that this is a very important thing. Uh, very much from the, from the standpoint of acknowledging the black woman and her contribution. And the contribution to the story. At the very outset of our events. And it is continues to be involved as a, a facilitator and supporter of this school that we started. But little else did I know that this gorgeous woman with this huge natural in 1968 when she was such a prophetic and profound, profound voice in terms of health care. She was a doctor. This doctor Ramona Tapsco. <laughs> I had an opportunity last November to be in Havana, Cuba. And I was invited to speak at the Maryland Di Girl Di Diamond League lecture, which they have there at the medical school in New York. Every year they invited me to speak. But I spoke to a group of more than 145 students, primarily women, women of color, over and over, and also a large contingent of African American students, African American women who were in medical schools in Cuba, which they've been doing for years and years. Elon 
times the largest medical school in the region. It trains more doctors than anyone else. And they spend a year learning Spanish before they begin their, their study in terms of medicine. They spend a year learning that. Now, this is important to note because when her, the Challenge of Burden Act was passed, there were two fit people who stood up at the time to make sure that these students, students who would not have been able to get in medical school or there was not space in medical school here in the United States, for them to go to school. There were two people who stood up. Colin Powell, who was the inter attorney general, said, no, we can put the act in place, but do not disallow primarily minority students from going to Cuba to study medicine. And the other one was a congressman from, from Mississippi, Denny Thompson, who had a number of his people, people from his state were going to medical school and were helped. Cuban doctors were the first doctors to respond to the Ebola crisis in Liberia. And when I talk about, when I talk about my great friend and classmate, Ramona Tasco, Congressman Tasco, she was one of the first doctors that responded to the earthquake in Haiti. She's been to the Congo on many occasions, assisting in them, their planning of their health service system. So we, we look at the picture in the terms of question about really health care is who lives matter? What lives matter? That's a real question about it. If we don't change and shift the paradigm about whose lives matter, then we certainly wouldn't we have black women physicians? Wouldn't we have uh, a plethora of, of, of minority women physicians? Because we have to, we have to change that. Where do we find ourselves in our change, changing that, the discourse of that, around who lives matter and the nature of a a a medical system, despite the Obama care, which is in crisis still. You know, a medical system that stands somewhere between per capita, almost eight thousand dollars per capita and ranks very low from, from everybody. So it's understandably that we're always trying to lift at the bottom up, using bottom or lifting the bottom up and raising and lifting the bottom. Those at the bottom, we also hopefully raise the ship itself and keep the ship lifted. But I think there's a, there's a the question that we have to, the fundamental questions that we have to look at in terms of healthcare. And let me say, I'm only, a, I'm only, a, artist and an activist. I've been active around healthcare when I was, was working in the city of town of San Francisco for the Model City program in 1971, 1971 to 1976. And the first thing that, that those community did, women like Espinosa Jackson, women like organizers like, like uh, uh, who, who else was there, who part, part of that, well, in fact it was, um, that's where it's run, uh, Eloise Westbrook, Eloise Brayman, the first thing that they addressed, it, addressed in 1971 was the issue of health community health. Organic, you know, intellectual community action. Sue Dorsey put up there. And first, was one of the first community actions was at, 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 at the time, the, the growing response to, um, um, help me out, um, um, the going response in it specifically. So I think on the one hand, it is important for us to acknowledge the extraordinary contribution and the potential for it's more even more extraordinary contributions with black women as, as physicians. But we have to also figure out how do we now change the narrative around healthcare itself. Well, I have to say this really related. That's the good thing, that the black women who go into medicine are changing. They are working on the system. When I was health commissioner, that's, we redirected some money. You look in this room, we've got a few black women out here who are physicians. And I think those, the good news, because you're right, the system has to change, but the good news is that those things are related. Ladies, I'd like to ask you a, a question. You can answer it individually. Yes, racism is a part of us from doing the things we could possibly do. But 
under other additional issues that we face that have to be addressed, uh, whether racism is there or not, in terms of inspiring our children to go on and do good and great things. What are some of those other obstacles that you see in terms of medical challenges, in terms of the industry, in terms of coming down to it, whatever? What are some of those issues, other than racism? I would um, certainly listen to what Dr. Jocelyn Elders had to say. You can't be what you can't see. <coughs> and in my case, um, my pediatrician was an African-American female. Dr. Pearl Foster in Jamaica, New York. And I have an image still very clearly in my mind of Dr. Foster, beautiful brown skin, stark white coat. And that was the first doctor that I knew. So I, I could see something I could see. And um, my decision to become a physician was not something that was an early thing. I came in three o'clock and decided at the end of my junior year in college to become a physician. But I had excellent parents who had prepared me and my sister for whatever we chose to do. Made sure that the schools were being fair to us and that we got the best education. York had to offer in the public schools. So when I decided at the last minute to become a physician, when my sister decided that rather than teaching, she would go into law, we were prepared for that change by our parents. But I don't know that we're preparing our children um, today. And um, if you don't mind, I'd like to give a little riddle on the heels of what you said. And I, I'd like anyone who has heard this before who knows the answer because you've heard it before, please be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but the riddle was that a man and his son were driving one winter night on an icy road. And they had a horrible accident. The man was killed. Father was killed. The son was badly injured. He was transferred to the nearest trauma center. And the decision was made that he required surgery. So the trauma surgeon was called and came down and saw the young man and looked at him and said, I can't operate on him. He's my son. Solve the riddle. Yeah, you can answer. This is how gender bias still exists today. And we should all be embarrassed. When I heard it, I was a trauma surgeon. I was training as the first female to do a trauma fellowship at the University of Maryland. The answer is that the, 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 the person, the surgeon, did not have to have a parent that's going to do it with the <laughs> And we still don't get that real because we're so biased up here that when you say surgeon and your name is Dr. Cross and you're on the airplane, somebody physically told you, give us some, physically barred you. From taking care of a man who is in dire need of medical attention because you're a black woman, you couldn't be a doctor. So this speaks to us all. And we need to really recognize our own biases. Now, if we feel that way and nobody can get the riddle, who hasn't already heard it, about gender, what do you think people think when they see your black people? <laughs> Of our children. And in the public schools, 
Jeremy Rickin's book, book, The End of Work, he talked about, he talked about the opportunity during the Civil Rights Movement to talk about our, our nation and the impact that that would have, not only as African American workers, but white workers at all. We refused to address the issue during the movement because it brought up a lot of complicated questions that we were willing not to deal with. The question is that with the paradigm and the, and the secret, how do we prepare people for the future, period? How do we prepare for people for the future in the way that it's going to change their lives and change their children's lives specifically? I was born 70 years ago. So there's a whole kind of a shift that has happened in the 70 years that I've, I've been on this planet. And certainly, what we have to prepare our young children for, our children for, and future generations, is a shift that's now going to be almost irreversible in terms of that. And in terms of what Danny was just talking about, I want to. Um, give you uh, something that if you please, please, please go home tonight and look at this on YouTube. It's a 15 minute video that will give you and your children information in terms of survival over the next 30 years. It's called Humans Need Not Apply. If you watch this video in terms of these stages, Blow your mind. It's called Humans Need Not Apply. It talks about the absurdity of blaming immigrant workers, etc., for the loss of jobs in this nation. And it talks about the invasion of robotics <coughs> and how many jobs have been lost and will be lost. Now, I thought that we were safe because he and I are in the creative field. A robot just wrote a feature film. <laughs> a robot. And you can see it on YouTube. Thank you. Question to you is racism, we understand. But internally, because she's giving me a list of questions to ask, uh, what can we do?
did my um, <coughs> training conventional art residency, and I went back to John Hopkins, uh, to Dwight's faculty, and that's the institution I was referring to still. And uh, Hopkins had graduated one female and two African Americans in his 50, that's 5 0 right. year history of training for the peace service. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this is going to change. <laughs> and it took sacrifice on my part for the admissions process for residency. Residency training program is arduous, and someone, one faculty, is going to go through, in, in the case of Hopkins, 600 applications a year for five spots. And I volunteered to help with that process. Now, in the beginning, it was fairly easy because we still had photographs of the application. So I could see who I was selecting. But it's a matter of changing the paradigm and selecting people who would ordinarily not be allowed an interview because of the bias of the person who's making that decision. By the time I finished my tenure at Hopkins, 32% of our residency training were African American and 20% were African American. If you don't take it upon yourself to do that, it will not happen. Right. And as individuals, we should all change something, an opportunity we had to pass it on. As a result, unbeknownst to me, I was training and raising up my own partners. I ended up practicing in Central Florida in an all African American orthopedic practice, nothing else like it in the world, with former students. Young men I had trained and gotten into the Hopkins program. They had gone on to become grown up physicians. So I had an all black practice. And to that practice, I brought the concept of mentorship. We are in our 11th year of mentoring the greatest at-risk group of Americans, and that is the young African-American male. 11 years ago, we started doing a little bit of a middle school, and the the principal get us 30 to 40 boys who are not up here, not down there, but somewhere in the middle where they can be inspired. We have been mentoring young men every year with the goal of keeping them from becoming a chalk line on the sidewalk. And uh, we've now ended our, our next year, we've got a whole new group of 30 young men. We graduated our first group last year. But that's what we can do. Keep that door open. Don't let it shut behind you when you get an opportunity. And pull someone else through. The same, same question. So I uh, am one of those physicians who um, wanted to prevent disease as opposed to just. And so public policy and population health just are, you know, that, that's who I am. I'm the commissioner of public health, and now as dean at Charles Drew, we're talking about programs and ways, but I can't get away from the policy piece. And I do think this kind of mentoring and reaching back and making sure you're not the last one is exactly how we change that system. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, we have got to change that system. We really do have to take things to scale. We have a wonderful program at Drew called the Saturday Science Academy. And it is from K through high school, and there are 100 <coughs> kids coming on Saturday, and they do all kinds of science. They have a white coat ceremony. It is to be celebrated. It is not going to solve this problem except for the few. <coughs> we have got a public policy problem. We have got to vote, and then we have got to hold people accountable. Um, I, you know, I understand party loyalty, especially now in this national election, but we have got to hold people accountable. And when you talk, I, I was one of 15 at Harvard Medical School Thank you. 
whose accessibility is at the local level. You know, you've had Prop 55 here. It's, that's here on the ballot right here. Prop 55, which is going to increase, increase the amount of resources to education. You know, are we going to pass a Prop 55? That's the only thing we're going to The The candidate who's going to be president. So, yeah, it has to be a process in which we use our power as citizens. And this is citizens, ordinary citizens. Demo, demos, crack. Ordinary citizens. Ordinary citizens take over responsibility that they are supposed to take on in creating the change as possible, at least within the framework of our discussion and our discourse, that we have some idea of the world that we want to imagine, the school system that we want to imagine, the way relationships we want to have, imagine between physician and patient, the way all those things, how do we now take those, I, the idea of King always talked about the dream, the dream is the fundamental force for change. How do we take those, those visions and that imagination and translate that into public policy? That becomes a Lead me to the last question, and uh, that's, a, that's an important. see these doctors on TV. What can media do? How can we impact the media in a way that we can increase the world's understanding of who we really are, what we've accomplished, and those kinds of things? What, what, how do you think media can impact that? What can this audience do in terms of, of shaping that? It's very interesting about when I think about media in a sense. Because historically, when I've watched media in the advent of mass media, what has happened is that mass media has responded to the, to the reaction of ordinary citizens. We didn't know anything. Once, once this young minister began to lead this, this boycott, you know, in Montgomery, we didn't know anything about it, but the, but the media, early television, latched on to it. And we found out about it all around the country and all around the world, mm. in a sense. So the media is that if we create it, if we create the, re the media, if we create the words and everything else, I think the media will come to us. So we have to create the movements. We have to challenge the media, in a sense. We can't expect the media to be the course. This film is a way of challenging the media, right here. Right here is an example of how we challenge the media. Then that's the media says, let me respond to it. Let me now find a way in, in, in which I have another picture, perhaps, of the story, another narrative. In there. And what I was thinking about, I was the national chairman of, of Sickle Cell's media. I was the national board of Sickle Cell media at one point in time. And that was, that's what, I couldn't think about Sickle Cell media, which is one of the things we identified in the Big Guns Point. I worked in the Big Guns Point in the Mission District in San Francisco, 1971 to 19 uh, through 1977, six and a half years. So, so, six and a half years. I'm sorry, I'm reversed. Then you remember the senior moments come time. Join the club. <laughs> We're going to open the floor to questions now. Okay, so please stand up. Please, please stand up. Please stand up. Please stand up. Please stand up. I just want to say that Crystal's work is phenomenal. And as a black woman physician, I was taken not just by the individual stories of those who are depicted in the movie, but the similarity of the energy, the personality, the dynamism, 
that allowed them to follow that course with such determination. What does not come out that I want to see included in this discussion is how much our passion was driven by our spiritual connection to our community. And that that spiritual connection to our community also translates into a form of social activism. Mm -hmm. And our profession is changing. It must change. The voices of physicians like Dr. Thomas and others, forgive me, I don't know what everybody's saying here. Okay. Yes. Okay. And yes, all of these doctors who are here who are typified in the book, I'm in the book, I think one of the things that we had going for us was an awareness of the connection between politics, sociology, psychology, economics, and of course history, anthropology, culture. And we brought that into the treatment room. And until our culture in medicine changes, to allow that to be affirmed, rather than our students coming in having to leave that back and then assimilate with the mainstream of medicine and become like doctors who don't look like that. Okay. The change begins also with us finding our voice and becoming more dynamic in our integration with the you know, Association of American Medical Colleges, okay. the American Medical Association, and that we end up being lobbyists up on Capitol Hill the doctors have to find their voice, yes. and we have to take our stethoscope outside of the treatment room, yes. outside of the hospital, yes. and become more integrated into our communities where we take our sense of empowerment and cross-cultivate that among our patients and our communities. Yes. That's all. situations which may negatively impact a person or a subgroup which disempowers them. So I think that if we were putting cultural competency um, at the forefront, then it wouldn't be like inventing the wheel every time we would just be, you know, making that the, 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 the focus. Thank you. There's a lady back there. Can the microphone, please? Right there?
Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. God bless you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.